Welcome on in to the No Huddle Show. I'm Matt Lombardo. If we're gearing up for Eagles versus Chiefs on Sunday afternoon at Arrowhead Stadium, Eagles are 1-0 coming off that big 30-17 to win over the Washington Redskins down at FedEx Field. But so much of the talk this week has been all about Andy Reid, all about Doug Peterson. And as always, we really appreciate you listening to these episodes. But if you're listening in a browser, if you're just stumbling across this on YouTube, if it came across your Twitter feed, do us a favor subscribe but you'll get the episodes quicker you'll you'll know when we have more episodes coming you can subscribe on itunes soundcloud stitcher iHeartRadio, spreaker google play youtube you really should subscribe to the show and then once you do if you enjoyed this episode if you enjoy the podcast in general please go ahead and leave us a five-star review. We love it. It helps us grow the show. It builds the show, builds the reputation of the show, and we really do appreciate it. So obviously, ahead of this week's game, it's been all about Andy Reid and Doug Peterson. Can Doug beat his mentor? Can Doug buck the trend of Andy Reid being 8-3 and three against his former assistant coaches? And can the Eagles go on the road into Arrowhead Stadium and win back-to-back road games? Those are all really big questions, and certainly to look back on Andy Reid, to look ahead to this week's game, we thought it'd be kind of cool to reach out to a player who used to play for not only Andy Reid and the Eagles, but is one of the greatest players to wear an Eagles uniform, especially along the offensive line. All pro, left tackle, he played in a Super Bowl for Andy Reid. Doug Peterson was his quarterback in 1999. His name is Trey Thomas. Trey, thanks for jumping on the No Huddle Show with us today. Oh, man, no problem. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And we're going to get into all kinds of conversation about your time with Andy Reid, your thoughts on that era of Eagles football, which to date has been the most successful in this franchise's history. But I also want to get your thoughts on the game last week, the game coming up against the Chiefs, and just your thoughts on this team, because I always like to pick the brain of former players, particularly guys that played at such a high level as you did. And before we get into this week, in week two, the Eagles are 1-0, and and I know that from you know conversations with you off the show you've gone back you've watched the all 22 you've rewatched the game what were some of your big picture takeaways from the win over the Redskins in week one I just think that you know the, the, the team you know they came out and they played a really good game I think the defense came out and played a solid game I was very impressed at what Nelson Aguilar was able to put together you know being a uh, being a receiver that was everybody was picking on him and you know talking about how we're going to keep him he comes back and has a solid game, you know, against the Redskins. I think that um, that was a really good, good, good push for him. Um, I think just overall, you know, just looking at Winston's performance, I think he had a very solid game. You know, a couple times, you know, he's out there making some plays on the run. Um, but also I think that when you look at the one play where, they were, uh, where he made the pass to, to Aguilar, you know, it wasn't a breakdown on the offensive line side. I think that was just a lot of coverage that was going on. And Wentz just being the athlete that he was, just being able to make a scramble around a little bit and find Aguilar for a touchdown. So, you know, you just want to continue to see plays like that. If the coverage is there to be able to, you know, make extend it. But also, you know, if it's not there, go ahead and get upfield and get whatever yards you can. I, I totally agree. And watching that game, I thought that that was the biggest takeaway from Carson Wentz, his ability to extend plays, make th- throws on the run. You know, his scrambling really came to the forefront. But the biggest big picture concern watching that game and then rewatching it again on the All-22 tray, at least in my opinion, was they didn't run the ball nearly enough. 13 times in the first three quarters, they only averaged 2.6 yards per carry. LeGarrette Blunt looked slow. The offensive line at times seemed like it got good push but they really struggled to get to that second level and when you played you played alongside guys like John running on the other side Hank Fraley at center Mm -hmm. some really stout offensive linemen Uh, from a lineman's Mm -hmm. perspective looking at that tape on Sunday how do you get this running game right with the personnel that they have right now whether it's offensive line or running back I think one of the things that when you look at the line I think sometimes they're spreading themselves a little too thin where they're stretching to to a guy that's outside. Well, he's in the box, but he's not really. I, I like my chances with Blunt against the safety. So sometimes you don't need to push the run play up to the safety. You want to take on the linebackers, make sure your backside is getting to the backside linebacker, whatever combination is going from the center to the mic, 
whatever the center is working up to the middle linebacker. And if you can get blunt, every run play is always designed to get the running back up to the safety. So I think a lot of times what you're seeing is that they're spreading themselves a little too thin where you're trying to push all the way up to the safety instead of taking care of the linebackers and letting the running back take on the safety. Because if you're pushing to the safety, then that means that there's a linebacker that's coming clean or a defensive lineman that's coming off of your combination because you went up to go take care of a safety. Do you think that something can be fixed in a week? Because this was supposed to be with Lane Johnson and Jason Peters and Jason Kelsey coming back and Brandon Brooks. This was supposed to be one of the strengths of the team, and it hasn't looked like that all through the preseason. Is that a correction you can make in a week of practice and studying film, or do you think this needs some bigger picture fixes here? I think it's a bigger picture fix where, where yeah. you're going to have to be the, the offensive line coach is, to, is going to have to be the guy to kind of sit down. Coach Stoutland is going to have to be the guy to kind of sit down and say, all right, you know what? We're spreading ourselves a little too thin right here. Let's, let's go back over how we want to have these combination blocks. And also having a quarterback to say, or the center and quarterback to be on the same page and say, you know what? I don't like what I'm seeing. It's going to spread us too thin if we're trying to get to the left. Let's go ahead and say black over, black over, and run the sister play to the right where you like the combinations on the other side a little bit better. And now the one player who I think that Eagles fans are going to be curious about, maybe not necessarily this year, but in the big, you know, the long-term future of this offensive line. And he had to play a lot on Sunday because Jason Peters went out with the groin injury. So he played about half the game, played 10 games last year in place of Lane Johnson. What have you seen out of Hullapula Vitae Vitae? And what did you see out him on Sunday? Because he seemed like he struggled a little bit. Well, you know what? Vitae has struggled a couple of times with just dealing with the silent count. You know, anytime you're on the road, you, you, you're dealing with the center's silent count, and he has to look at the head movement of the center. And that's one of the things that if you're a second offensive lineman, you're always dealing with the second center. So it's a matter of – and you can tell, like, Jason Peters and Lane Johnson, they don't have the same problem. They get off the ball a lot quicker. So Vitae has, has historically – Struggled a little bit when he because because uh, last year when he stepped in against Washington, I think that was his first time getting in there on the road and having to deal with that silent count. I think the silent count is what's throwing him off and it makes him late off the ball. So you see him struggling a little bit. And I think that's where he gave up that first second. Then the next one, he got a spin move on because he feel like he's laid off the ball. So I think what Doug Peterson started doing was you start bringing the receivers in a little tighter, bringing the tight ends a little tighter. So they can run up, run their routes upfield to throw that defensive end's timing off to kind of slow them down to kind of help them out a little bit. Trey, turning the page to this Sunday, the Eagles are one and zero. They took care of business against the Redskins, thirty to seventeen. But as we talked about at the start of the show, it was really the defense that carried this team. It was the the strip fumble return for a touchdown by Cox. Mm -hmm. It was the four sacks. Mm -hmm. It was the four turnovers. But looking ahead to the Chiefs, a team that went in and just in one of the most hostile environments in the league, blew the doors off the defending champion Patriots. What's the matchup in this game from an Eagles standpoint that you are most confident about against the Chiefs? What area of the Chiefs, be it somewhere on offense or defense, can the Eagles exploit and take advantage of? I think it has to be up front. We yeah. need our rushers to get to the quarterback. Everything is won and is battled in the trenches. And I think that if we can get to that quarterback, if we can get to Alex Smith before – 2.5 seconds, I think we have a chance if you can get a helmet on him. Now you have an offensive line that is starting to come along with the Kansas City where now they're going to mix in the run. I mean, you bring in a running back like Hunt that just went out and set an NFL record offensive performance on the world stage, you know, against New England Patriots. You know, he comes out and just has a, a massive game. You, you have to understand that they're going to mix it up a little bit. But I think every, for us to have a chance to win this game, our defensive line is going to have to get the penetration that they did last week. You're going to need to see another game out of Cox of where he's playing. We're going to need to see our ends get a little bit more active. I think what, what I like the nice mixture of what we're bringing in. When you bring Chris Long in off the, off the bench, that's going to be a nice change of pace. You add Michael Kendricks into that mix where you get him blitzing a little bit. And, of course, you bring BG back in. I want to see a little bit more out of Vinny Curry a little bit, getting it to the quarterback. You start seeing him starting to get a little bit more penetration towards the end, but you need to have that coming earlier in the game.
And my biggest worry, Trey, and let me know how you feel about this, is the just the amount of offensive weapons this Chiefs offense has, starting with Alex Smith, who's a guy mm-hmm. that loves to get rid of the football quickly. You mentioned it. I talked mm-hmm. to Fletcher Cox in the locker room yesterday. He, he said the biggest key is to get to him because he gets rid of it in under three seconds. You have the dynamic rookie mm-hmm. in Kareem Hunt, who had over 200 rushing yards, close to 100 receiving yards, couple of touchdowns. Mm-hmm. Then you got to deal with Tariq Hill without your best cornerback. So how do you yeah. slow down how do you stop the dynamic Kansas City offense you have to get to the quarterback I mean you have to get (laughs) to the quarterback whatever your pass rush is you need to keep changing up the pace you always want to make your tackles always guess you see what I'm saying because one of the things I like to look at when I'm talking to defensive ends and when I study defensive ends I like to see you know what do they always line up with the same footback because if they do then you're always making contact at the same point so it's always, you know, are you going to be one of those defensive ends that keeps changing up which foot you put back? Because then now you're keeping the offensive tackle guessing. Now this is going to be a road game for us. So you're going to be dealing with tackles that's going to be sitting there watching you, you know. So you're going to have to be a little bit more, you know, direct with what you want to do, a little bit more aggressive in how you want to attack. Make sure that your games are on time. You know, because you don't want to make your games a little late. You know, you want to make sure that you're paying attention to which way the center is sliding. And we have to get a helmet on the quarterback, especially when you have big time receivers out there like Hill and, and with Hunt. All right, let's get into the crux of this coaching matchup. Let's get into your memories of Andy Reid from your time here in Philadelphia, Trey. I'm sure you have some great stories, but your second year after being chosen in the first round of the 98 draft was the year that Doug Peterson was the quarterback. He was kind of the placeholder, if you will, for Donovan McNabb and took over against the Redskins later on in that season. But being the backup quarterback, I know that the backups, you know, they play a a pretty key hand in putting together the game plan every week. What do you remember about the dynamic of Peterson as the backup and Andy Reid as the head coach working together? How similar were they back then? Man, that was my second year in the league. I have no idea. <laughs> you know, I, I was still just happy to be there. You know, like, oh, man, this is awesome. I'm in the NFL. You know, but, um, yeah, I, I see that. I, I just One of the things that I remember when Doug Peterson was here was just how hard it was. Because, I mean, we were we came off of my rookie year where we were 3-13. and 13, And then, you know, the second year, what, I think we were like 6-10. and 10. And, you know, it was, I, th- I just really, you know, we – you have to be such a tough player when you come to Philly. And, you know, and it's, I just remember how tough it was for him with the fans and everything. And it was just, it was really rough. Yeah, no, I I got you. That was a long time ago. And a lot of football was played between now and then last (laughs) week. Last week, Jeffrey Lurie, the owner, had a press conference, and afterwards, it was myself, it was Elliot, it was a group of beat writers, just kind of having a little bit of a BS session afterwards, and Jeffrey told this story about the first time he took Andy Reid out to dinner after hiring him, and... Andy Reid didn't order one steak. Andy Reid didn't order two steaks. He he ordered three steaks in the dinner with the owner. So so tell me your your, your off-the-wall, never-before-told, best memory, best story about your time playing with Andy Reid. Man, Big Red was just – first of all, we always called him Big Red, you know. And, you know, he was just always just a a, a second father to me, you know. And it it was so funny. Like, you know, he would always call me and McNabb into his office. And, you know, and he would always tell us these stories about how Reggie White and Brett Favre were always the guy, the early ones on the field, and, you know, the last ones off the field. And we just always, you know, man, you guys need to be like Reggie White and Brett Favre. They were always so dependable and, and all this stuff. And, and you know, and, and Coach Reed, you know, Big Red, you know, you just never, you know, he, he would always keep a list of all the things you did wrong, you know. And he was like, you know what, he pulled out this long list of, all right, Trey, you did this, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, you, I let you slide on this. And I'm like, well, hold on, I didn't know you were keeping tabs of all of these things. And he had, he had like a long list of all the stuff that me and McNabb did wrong, you know, during our time, during the earlier years, until we started maturing and started acting a little bit more like Brett Favre and Reggie White. <laughs> so, so, so he made his point. He, he had the uh, demerits yeah, list, his point. if you will, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that was always hidden until we had to go in and see him. And then he pulls out this list and it was like Santa Claus list, you know, and he was like, okay, you did this. You didn't do that. You didn't do that. You know, you did this and I let it slide, but you need to make sure you kind of kick up on that. But he was always just a great coach and just, 
you know, I always really cared about, you know, the guys that were in the locker room and, and, and just always put us first. Big Red with a uh, a Santa Claus naughty list. That's great. All right, I, I got to ask, <laughs> yeah. because coming off of Jeffrey saying that, that Andy could eat three steaks in one sitting, how many cheeseburgers could he put away in one sitting? Do you, do you remember ever just I, him just housing cheeseburgers at any point, how many he could eat at one time? I never watched Big Red eat, man. I would just come in and do my, you know, really? he was like, hey, I treat you to a cheeseburger. And I'll go get my own cheeseburger because, I mean, we're all linemen. We're all big. You know, we just not. Because, you know, you know, you got to think now, back in the day, man, this was before you have the linemen that you have now where everybody's all 315, 320, nice and lean. You know, back in the day, man, all of us were about 340, 350, man. So, you know, we coming in the double cheeseburgers by ourselves. You know, we can, we, we're going to order in cheesesteaks after weigh-ins. You know, everybody thinks light thoughts and jumps on the scale. And then I have to have cheesesteaks at the end, you know, for everybody to eat, you know. So it was – it was that type of vibe where we, we, you know, shoot, we were we were elbows deep in our own sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> too, too busy chowing down to see what coach was putting yeah, back yeah. there, right? So, so do yeah, you think exactly. that Doug has? Do you think Doug has any sort of edge going to the, into this game, given how well he knows Andy, how well he knows his tendencies and his coaching styles? Because Andy's eight and two, eight and three rather, against former assistant coaches. Do you think Doug, having played for him and coached with him for so long, has any sort of advantage? Uh, you know what? It's hard to say. You know, I think that they're both going to come in and and it's going to be that chess match where they, they understand the systems of each other. Um, and then it's a home game for him. I mean, the advantage is very is tilted very heavily and coaches read in coach Reed's favor, especially with them being eight and ten over his former would you say eight and three or eight and ten over his former uh, coaches. So, you know. The, the favor is tilted in his way, but I'm really hoping that Doug Peterson really – I like some of the stuff that he's been doing, stepping outside of the box with some of his play calling. So I think Doug like what? Might give, give me, give me an example stuff. that you like. So I, like I, 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 I like the one play where he sent Aguilar in, in motion and then had him come. It was like a half motion, pop right back out, little play. Um, one of the things I do want to see a little bit more of is just being able to establish the run, like you said, and, and making sure you correct those combination blocks. But, uh, you know, I think that he has a couple little plays, a couple little different little plays that he's like the, that's a little bit outside of the box of what you typically see in a game. Absolutely. And Carson Wentz drew some comparisons to Donovan McNabb because of that escapability of his last week, mm -hmm. particularly because of the Nelson Aguilar play. You and I joked about this mm -hmm. earlier in the week that it reminded me a lot of the time where Donovan scrambled out mm -hmm. of the pocket, scrambled, scrambled, then threw it up to Freddie Mitchell. And, you know, Freddie checked mm -hmm. the watch at the end. What sort mm -hmm. of similarities, if any, do you see between Carson and Donovan? And do you think that there's a quarterback in the league right now that you would compare Carson to that that's kind of his ceiling or the type of player you think he can become? I, I think Carson can be uh, as good as he wants to be. Um, and you can tell that he really wants to be great. You can tell like he and, and then he has the arm he has. You know, you can tell that he doesn't have any fear of letting letting the ball go. Um, to draw comparisons to him and five, I think both of them can be scrambling quarterbacks. I think one of the things that Carson does really well, though, he doesn't push too far back in the pocket, and when he makes up his mind, he's gone. You know, so I, I think that both of them are really good quarterbacks. It's hard to compare the two. I think, uh, you know, but for Carson, I just think that he's a – who can you compare him to, though? Right. Um, because, I mean, he's not like a Russell Wilson that's going to be back there dancing around the whole time or anything. But I think he's a little bit sharper with his delivery. Um, I really Big don't know Ben comes to mind to for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big Ben, I think, you know, because he has the, you know, the, the, the arm strength and can put it in there, has no fear. But um, it has a, has a really good size on him as well. So I, now, I really don't know, man. Yeah. Go ahead. Now, 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 let's think back to Super Bowl week with Andy Reid. Let, let's think back to what that was like for you, because he is a team right now in the Chiefs that after that win in Foxborough, and maybe even going into the year, a lot of people looked at the Chiefs as a potential Super Bowl contender in the AFC. What was that week like for you as far as the way he prepared his team and treated you guys down there in Jacksonville? It was just like another week. Um, I think that we um... – it was a regular week. I, it's, you know, it was, it was a lot of, you know, let's make sure that we're in by a certain night. You know, there was a lot of curfews. There was, but it, as far as the practice at our meeting times, it was just like any other week. You know, just let's get ready to go to work. 
And, and that's funny because that's something Doug talked about yesterday. I asked him what what makes Andy so successful with time to prepare. And obviously you guys didn't come out on the winning side of that ledger against the, the Patriots in the Super Bowl. But Andy's mm-hmm. something like 15 and three after the bye. And Doug said exactly mm-hmm. that. It comes down to Andy's a guy who does it the same way every week. He takes the time, mm-hmm. adds extra time in the film room, extra time with the players. You played in other places after leaving here. Was that unique to Andy? Did other head coaches work as hard as he did in terms of the details of film study and, and building that rapport with his players, or is that just the way it is league wide? Um, I don't think so. I don't think it's all league wide. You know, I think that uh, because I only went to Jacksonville after this. Sure. So I only played with one other team, and then I went to San Diego for training camp. But um, uh, but just being under Coach Reed, you you just knew that. He, I think that also he always had really good coaching staff. He always did a good job of building up his coaching staff that were really good teachers of what they wanted you to accomplish. So I think that's what separated it. And then I think all of his coaches were really good at teaching guys how to watch film and how to prepare. Because I think with Juan Castillo being there as our offensive line coach, he really helped us out a lot in giving us that extra time and taught us how to study the guy and how to get prepared. Now, one one last thing about your days with the Eagles and your time with Andy. Hall of Fame finalists came out, uh, semifinalists rather, and there are a lot of people talking about Donovan's chances of getting in, uh, Brian Dawkins' chances of getting in, T.O. He was eligible for the first time last season, didn't get in. Uh, who should be in? It's okay to say yourself here. I mean, you went to you know yeah, multiple Pro Bowls, you were an All-Pro, but – Who's the first guy from that era through the door at Canton? Who's the first Hall of Famer from those Andy Reid Eagles? Um, I, I, I think, you know, Dawkins definitely should have gone. You know, I, I think Dawkins definitely should have gone. Um, I would like to see McNabb go, you know, just because of what he's done through the organization, just with our records, all the records that have been um, set off of that, off of that team from during that era. You know, I would love to see myself. Shoot, I'm trying to get in the Eagles Hall of Fame. You know, everybody else been put in, into uh, into the Hall of Fame based off of their numbers. Westbrook, McNabb, even Akers going into it. But, you know, get your boy in there. But, you know what I'm saying? You never know. Yeah. I, I would love to see Dawkins, though, you know. No, I agree with you. What's the pick for Sunday? Who wins the game? What's the score? Oh, man. Uh, I, of course, you know, I, I love Big Red. That's my man. But I, I would love to see. Doug just come in and do his thing, put together the team and just go out there and, and get a win. Um, I don't see this being like a high scoring game. Maybe let's go to shoot. I'm going to go 30, 28 Eagles. 30, 28 Eagles. Look at that. Yeah, the upset like... at Arrowhead. He's trained yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. All pro, multiple time pro bowler, first round pick in 98. Trey, appreciate the time. We'll have to do this further up the road. All right, no problem. <laughs> 